thank you for inviting me here, giving me this opportunity to talk about the work that we've been doing and as well as some others on the neurobiology of social relationships, which is really what I study. So uh, in our family units, uh, which is what we see here, we have some relationships that are really very evolutionarily ancient. You find these across all mammals, for example. Uh, so, for example, the mother-infant bond that you'll find in, in rats and mice and dogs and cats. Um, so it's evolutionarily very ancient, so you might imagine that the, the brain mechanisms that are controlling that uh, may be similar to what you find in animals. But we also have relationships that are somewhat different than most other mammalian species in the sense that we have partnerships between the male and female, the lovers. So I'm interested in what are the brain mechanisms that help create that bond between these two individuals. If you want to get down to the chemistry and know what are the, the molecules that are involved in the process, you have to first start with an animal model. And these are the animals that I study. These are called prairie voles. These are from the Midwestern United States. And they are a great model for studying uh, social behavior because their family structure is very similar to ours. And there's one molecule that I'm going to highlight a lot today. It's called oxytocin. This molecule is... Uh, known to be involved in all kinds of social relationships. What we also know from animal studies is that, that molecule is involved in the formation of the bond between the mother and the offspring. How do we study whether two voles are bonded or not? Uh, we have this test we call a partner preference test. And what we do is we put a male and female together, and during this time they can, we can allow them to mate, or we can prevent them from mating, or we can give them various drugs to see um, what molecules are involved in this process, and then we test them on a partner preference test. And basically, here we're asking if the female is bonded with her male partner. We take the male partner, put him on one side. He's tethered so he can move around here, but he can't get out. We put a novel male on that side. He's tethered. He can't get out. Drop the female in the middle and see who she spends her time with. And, and what we find is that if the animals mate, or if we do something to create a bond, the pair bonded animals will sit next to each other more than, much more than they will sit next to the other guy. So this is how we assess whether the animals have developed a bond. And through this kind of assay, um, we've been able to discover that a molecule, that this oxytocin molecule, which is involved in mother-infant bonding, also, if we, if we inject a female perivol without oxytocin and place her in the cage with a male, even if she doesn't mate, that single injection of that molecule will then create a bond between those two. Oxytocin is not the only molecule that's involved in the pair bond. We also know of several others. I'm just going to mention two more now. Uh, one is called dopamine. This is what cocaine acts on. This is what produces pleasure, reinforcement, helps with learning. Uh, also opiates. If you block opiate receptors, the animals do not form a bond. So these three chemicals are acting in the brain to help create this bond. And we've been studying the, the role of early life experience. I think we all can appreciate how early life nurturing um, or neglect can impact their later life behavior. So we've done this little experiment where we take the little prairie voles, and for just three hours a day, we take them and we isolate them, put them in little social isolation chambers, just for three hours, for the first two weeks of life, and then we let them, and then after that, we treat them as normal, so they stay with their, their parents. And then when they grow up, we look and see how it affects their ability to relate to others as adults. And what we find, this is work done by my, my graduate student, Katie Berry, is that the control animals, uh, if female, these females that are paired with a male for 48 hours, they form a nice partner preference. They spend much more time with the partner and the stranger. But those animals that get that early life stress just for the first two weeks of life later on have a very difficult time forming this kind of pair bond. So that tells us that early experience has a big impact. Uh, this is a study that we did a few years ago at Emory where we looked at women now. This is women, not voles. These women in their early life as children experienced abuse and neglect. And then we sampled the oxytocin levels in their CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid. And what we can see is that the animals that have, sorry, the, the people um, who had several different kinds of, um, that, that experienced more abuse and neglect actually had lower levels of oxytocin in their brain when they became adults. So early life nurturing experiences can have a long-term impact on the brain and particularly areas of the brain that are involved in social relationships. People started asking, what does oxytocin do in people? Okay, And they were able to deliver oxytocin intranasally. So if you sniff oxytocin, some of that can apparently get in the brain. And one of the first studies that came out that had a big impact showed that it increased trust you know, oxytocin increased trust. Uh, how can that be used um, ethically or maybe not so ethically? You know, maybe I work in a department of psychiatry, and they, they always are trying to get the patients to trust them. 
maybe oxytocin could be used by the psychiatrist to actually gain the trust of the patients. Um, you know, should oxytocin be sold over the counter so that people could use it, maybe in not so uh, ethical ways? Uh, what about um, children, you know, parents wanting to give children oxytocin to make them more social? We know that being social affects uh, success in life, and you, you can pharmacologically manipulate that. And then finally, you know, everyone always asks about this. What about using oxytocin for marital therapy? People pay lots and lots of money to a therapist to get help build relationships. Well, here's something that can increase trust, bonding, and maybe uh, it should be, drug should be used in cooperation with the therapy.